So I'm Marcus. I guess you've seen me around the conference a bit this couple of days. Uh, I will work for a company called Reisegiganten, which is a travel company that operates charter sites in the Scandinavian re region. And uh, we're mostly Perl-based, with uh, a lot of our new development being focused on uh, malicious and uh, some of it is now running in Kubernetes as well. I'm also one of the Mojo core devs since the pre-010 days, so I've been around this project for a while, I guess. Uh, yeah. So this talk is called Perpetual Release Machine, and uh, it's a subtitle Automated Testing of Mojo Apps with Drone and Rolling Deployments to Kubernetes. So you should stop petting your Perl projects and get into farming them. And the talk will focus on setting up your Kubernetes delivery pipeline and uh, how to test your codes with the drone CI. So we should in engage the continuous integration, I guess. Yeah, there's a quick disclaimer on my talk. Uh, all the examples in the talk will be based on the Google Cloud infrastructure, which is really good for running Docker and Kubernetes and the like. Uh, I would really recommend, if you can, that you use a cloud-based Kubernetes solution if you want to run Kubernetes, because setting it up on bare metal can be extremely complicated and give you some trade-offs on how to deal with, for instance, storage or, or networking or ingresses and things. Uh, so if at all possible, use uh, Google or Amazon or, or uh, Microsoft's uh, cloud offerings to run Kubernetes. Uh, so, when I started in the industry, like we used Oh, what the hell. Okay, sorry. Uh, yeah, so we used to do waterfall, I guess, and we did releases every second year. So you could have like really complicated and, and arcane ways of making release uh, installers and spending a lot of time on packaging. Uh, but last thing is I've moved towards more agile methods and, and uh, maybe doing releases every sprint. Uh, uh, this has become uh, more and more of a priority for everyone to automate your release pipelines and to, to, to automate testing. And eventually, I think most of us want to move towards continuous deployment. That's how, it, that's like the logical conclusion. Once you start doing releases every two weeks, you get this, a lot of this friction and you find, find okay, and then it's best if uh, we test every feature branch and we ship it directly out and we don't have to deal with some the, the concern that maybe some other developer pushed something else and it will be a part of my deployment. Everyone is responsible for the thing that I push when it goes through the CI pipeline. Uh, yeah, so that's the way things go. And uh, I think that a lot of the industry now has landed on Kubernetes for, for doing this. Uh, so it was initially released four years ago by Google, and it was based on their own internal system for doing these kind of things. So this is the Wikipedia blurb that we see here, uh, uh, an open source container orchestration system for automating deployment, scaling, management of containerized applications. Uh, but uh, it's written in Golang, and it's basically a declarative reconciliation loop. It means like you declare how you want the state to be, and it will do its best to make sure that this state keeps hold, keeps being this, no matter what happens. If you like, uh, if one of your nodes crashes, it will move things over. If uh, you you want to do an upgrade, it will coordinate this to reach the state that you want in a, in the fashion that you you require, and it will automatically schedule things for you to make sure that that you maintain the state that you want to have. Uh, so yeah, it's uh, good for running your clusters in clusters, I guess. Uh, uh, for, but uh, mostly we use it to use stateless things. But you can also use like uh, stateful sets to run even your solar or your servers, but sometimes that's probably not worth it. It's, it's mostly for running your own web, web applications or, or your front of your deployments. Uh, so first, if you want to have this thing, I guess we need to make some containers. You have to have, uh, for now it's typically Docker that, that's being used for this, and uh, then you have to write a Docker file. So, in my example here, I'm using the Ubuntu 18.04 base image. Note that that's now become significantly better than before because by default, Ubuntu now uses the minimal images which start at 80 megabytes size. Before, they were quite a bit bigger. Uh, and then, like, there are, then, then uh, this format has, like, uh, first, which package you come from. And then uh, you have you do when you do run those are hap happening at compile time when the image is being built. Uh, you can add your application like this, uh, 
and then you change the directories there. So in my example here, I'm installing from cpanm just uh, in all the dependencies, and I'm skipping tests for, for uh, uh, speed. We expect our application to be well tested, so we don't test uh, our dependency chain. Uh, and then uh, uh, I'm deleting the cpanm directory to reduce the size. So this example is exposed to the 8080 port, and uh, it defaults the mode to dev so that you can set it to whatever you want in as an environment variable in Kubernetes. Uh, and then uh, we, we just run the application as a pre-fork. Uh, and we set up a PID file as well so that we can control it later. We'll see a little bit how we use that later and just listen to port 880 which we exposed in the Docker container. Uh, so uh, you can see that I'm trying to reduce layer size, but there are still some room for optimization for this, this thing. I don't know if you can see some, some things that could have been done better to make it smaller. This, this thing will end up being maybe even though it's a simple application, it will end up being some 100 megabytes. Uh, one thing we could do, we could run this step here together with the cpanm step, and then we could uninstall build essentials once we have the, um, the, the dependencies installed from cpan, if we do that as, as one pipeline. Uh, we could also, for instance, uh, disable man page generation, which will, be, will happen by default. Like in our work application, man pages alone are like 40 megabytes extra data that you really don't need because you can use just a per doc command. So if you set the uh, install man tree there or an install man one there to none, then, then that will skip. So how you actually do the install inside the Docker container kind of depends on your setup. Maybe your company uses Carton, then you can just use Carton to make sure that you pin the dependency versions to whatever you want. Or this approach would obviously get the latest one once. Uh, but we can look at some other ways of, of handling that as well if you require pinning, but you just want to use a normal tool chain. We'll come a little bit later in my talk. So uh, when you do the build here, in my example, I've been using GCR data, so I'm building well, the current folder, I keep, uh, typically keep my Docker files uh, with the application in the root directory. And then, so this will just use that as a context, and that's what you, you will be adding here, right? Uh, then you will get something like this. So here you can see that this is the second time I'm running this, so it's actually caching the first step, but here it would be installing the, the Debian packages, and then it's just doing all of the things I've said. So this particular application that we are installing it's just a newly generated Moeulicious Hello World application, which means it has one dependency, which is Moeulicious, which has been installed here. If you, if you add more things to your cpan file or makefile.pl, they will be installed in that step. And then uh, the, everything, like I said, is exposing the port and uh, running. And eventually, it's tag building a, a, a hash here, which is tag tagged with the, uh, with the ID that I gave it when I started up. So. Here we're just using 0 0.1. That's not really good for, for continuous deployment. So we'll look at the, maybe a better strategy for that afterwards. But anyways, now my code is in a container. So now do, what do we do? Well, so you saw that I tagged it with the GCRIO, and that's a Google contain, Google's cloud reg registry, uh, which is our private uh, uh, image registry that stores your Docker images as like in uh, S3-like blobs on, 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 uh, 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 on, on Google Cloud. So you could obviously put the thing in Docker Hub, but possibly you don't want your application to be publicly available. So some sort of registry is in need. You could also set up your own registry using the open source tools of Docker. But that, or you could use GitLab, I suppose. I heard a lot about GitLab this week, so I, I know some of you like it. Uh, yeah. So. Uh, now we kind of want to deploy this thing to, to a Kubernetes cluster. And that means we should make a deployment. A uh, deployment is a high-level construct in, in Kubernetes that manages replica sets. So it's a lot of layers here. So a replica set is a, 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 a replication controller. It's uh, something that, that creates pods, so make sure that you have the required numbers of pods with your pod specification running in your cluster. And the pod is a collection of one or more Docker containers that are. So you can, for instance, have your application, or maybe you have, maybe you have like a another sidecar thing to uh, automatically proxy all your MySQL SQL requests to Google Cloud SQL, or uh, yeah, it kind of depends. But there's a Docker specification that will be in your deployment. We'll look at in detail how that works. And like, so the replication replica set here, like 
one in the, when it's on the version one, then maybe the pods are running there, and then you, you do a set image to a new version, then it will create a new replica set and then move things over. Uh, unlike the replica set, replication controller will also make sure that you, those pods are always running. So uh, for instance, if this node dies, it would take this controller and move it over here if you're on version one, or it would take on version two, it would move, move this one to one of those other two nodes to make sure that uh, you always have a sane state of running your application. You can also set different kind of constraints, like these two uh, deployments should never run on the same pod set, or this. Uh, or you can tag your nodes. For instance, if you have like a, a this separate no a load with uh, some some uh, application that requires a lot of CPU and another one that requires a lot of memory, you can make sure that it will schedule uh, your deployment on the right kind of nodes there. Uh, yeah, so let's look at how you create one of those uh, deployments. So uh, typically, the, you can use, use a JSON file or YAML. I kind of like YAML eventually. I, I've been like it conflicted, conflicted over years, but I can't really stand uh, all writing, all writing all the, the all the writing overhead of doing JSON. So I've accepted the, the trade-off, and I write like baby YAML basically, and I'm happy with that. Don't use the crazy features, but uh, uh, yeah. So here you specify the your API version, and it's that it's a deployment, and you set some metadata. You label your app, uh, you can, and then you provide a name. So you typically use these labels to match up just both for uh, for uh, for your specification and for like services later on. So uh, it's like the tag basically for your thing. And here in this specification, I've said that I want there to be two replicas. Like this, of course, depends if your application needs. To have scale up, you could increase the number of replicas, and you could even set up auto scale rules to make sure that it, it has a suitable number of replicas running. Uh, and then the selector match ref refers to the label. The selector refers to the label over there. And then the strategy that in the specification tells, tells how should the deployment do upgrades. And we, I always want to do rolling updates, so that's what I, I'm doing. And here we say it's acceptable, like of these two replicas, it's acceptable to have one unavailable. If that's not acceptable, you could set it to zero, and then it would create a new one before it kills the other one. But here it will tear down one, and then spin up another one, and then once that is up, it will spin up another one. Uh, a max search is how many new ones you're accepting it for, for it to create. Uh, yeah. So uh, this is a continued of the same file, and then you have to make a template. This is like simplest kind of template. I'm not using a lot of, there's a lot of options you can set here, but this is pretty much like the basics. Uh, again, we refer to the label, and then you can see that we have a one container in this uh, the spec here. It's the, spe the container spec for the, the pod that's running in this deployment, and this is just running uh, one container which is using the GCRIO, my project, my app image that we just built uh, with name my app, and we're specifying the same port that we use in the Docker file that we want to expose here. Uh, so now that we have that, to be able to refer to that internally, we need to make a, make a, a simple service that maps, for instance, port 80 to the 8080 port on, on the Docker container, like that. And that also uses the labels to refer back to, to whatever. So you could have like several deployment like version one or with all a different name, and as long as they use the same label, they would, would all get traffic in our own Robin fashion. So for instance, if you need an A/B testing or something like that. Uh, and this is just a node port, so it's uh, available on the, uh, as a port, as a high high end port on each node of, of your cluster. But typically, what you want is to expose this to the internet in some sort of fashion, which means that you need an ingress. And the ingress is in this example. Uh, the in the, I've set the specifically set the class ingress class to be the nginx ingress, so you can have more than one kind of ingress running in your cluster. But this is just a, a nginx running. In, in a container that has the network set up automatically. So that means, and it, and it uh, responds to various of these annotations that you can specify. So you could, for instance, specify that it should do basic auth if, you're, if uh, you want your app to be protected by basic auth, or you could use OAuth to, to protect, protect your application. Uh, you can also use annotations to set, for instance, set up Let's Encrypt so that you get. Uh, automatic HTTPS, and then would, would do the whole uh, verification loop and, and make sure that the cert manager would make sure that, that uh, you always have a up-to-date uh, SSL certificate. Uh, 
Yeah, and this here is uh, for external DNS. So, uh, the, so uh, I have the deployment running that reads this and updates Google's DNS servers with, with this host name. So it, whatever uh, external IP my, my ingress is, it has will automatically be assigned to this DNS host name. Uh, so if, if the IP changes, it will keep it updated. Uh, yeah, so here I see I, I forgot to update an IAM to my app. It should not be a RG frontend, which is right <laughs> again, but uh, yeah, you, can, you get the idea. And you, here you specify what we host it should be. And so this is not a HTTP server, it's just being exposed on port 80. Uh, yeah, so when we want a new version, we can just do this, right? We can do kubectl set image deployment, blah, 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 and then the my app container should use image gtr so, so if we change the 01 here to 02, then it would do a rolling update from 01 to 02. Uh, and uh, follow the rules that we specified in deployment for home and for search. And if it fails, it would still keep the old one around, and then you would have to go and resolve that. You can also use kubectl rollout to see the status of your rollout, see the history of how things are going. If you notice on the ways that you don't want to continue the rollout, you could do a pause, for instance, to stop the rollout in the middle and, uh, or, or abort it, I guess. Uh, yeah, so as we do this a lot of times, probably, we really want zero downtime uh, deployments. And so we probably should provide a lifecycle hook because by default, uh, when the pod is finished, it will just send a, a kill signal to it, and the way malicious will handle that is just to, to end the application. So typically what we want to do is to send a sig quit before, when, before it finishes, so that uh, malicious will start a grace. So Kubernetes has already stopped, at this point, Kubernetes has already taken it out of rotation, so it will not receive new requests, but it can have ongoing requests. So what we do is send a sig quit to it, and here's the PID file that we referred to earlier when we set up uh, uh, the um, pre-forking server. So we do that, and then we sleep for a while. And the, how, much, how much do you sleep? You have to make sure that your time-ups match up so that uh, you don't end here before you actually know that. that uh, so if you have long running requests, you, uh, you probably have longer timeouts, and then your things will stay around for a longer time. Uh, so ideally, you would have some sort of blocking method to do this using wait PID, but uh, it's not really, for most cases, this is fine and sufficient if you don't, uh, but uh, like it could be, be make more efficiency if you have a lot of things running and you want to uh, make sure that it, the, the things quit as soon as possible. Right, so now we have continuous deployment, I guess. We can just continue doing this forever, uh, except maybe it's not very automatic to do it like this, and uh, also we're not actually running the tests, are we? So uh, what I do is I use uh, drone IO, which is an automated CI system. It can watch like GitHub, Bigbucket, Gogs, Gitea, or even like GitLab, like you mentioned. And uh, it sets up a hook, uh, a web hook that it gets called on every commit. And then it gets the commit and starts running a set of smoking uh, uh, tests on it, right? I'm running it in Kubernetes with a simple deployment, and uh, it has like a, a server and a, a limit uh, number of, of workers. So you can scale this up the same way you do your own applications. You could set it up so that it will auto scale up if all your workers are busy, so that you make sure that you don't have like a long wait for your CI if, if your developers are really busy at some period. Uh, and it uses a Docker Compose compatible format called drone.iml. So there are lots of plugins for, for Docker and Kubernetes and Slack notifications and a lot of different things. Amazon Web Services, uh, on-prem. There's ton of there's a marketplace with a lot of plugins. And each plugin is basically just a Docker uh, image that is being run with a specified set of rules. So let's look at a simple drone OIML that can help us to do get uh, uh, continuous deployment running, so your .drone YAML will start with a pipeline, and then uh, it will have a certain pipeline steps going. Uh, so here we're just doing a simple prove to make sure that our unit tests are running. If the last command in, in one of these, or if a command in one of these actually fails, then the pipeline will automatically stop unless you 
hard-code and specify that it should continue on failure. So the default for it is to look at the return value. And prove will automatically have a, have a uh, false return value if, if the tests fail. And the drone will also, at runtime, show you the, the output of all of your commands live via WebSockets. So you don't have to wait for it to be finished. If you have a long-running test, you can already start looking at it while it's running through the web interface. Uh, so hopefully your test does more than actually uh, com check for compile, but uh, whatever your test is, that's what it will run here. And if they pass, then we will move on to the next step. So uh, typically what we maybe want to do is make a Docker image like we did manually there. Uh, and here it's using the Docker plugin. Uh, and it's uh, mounting up a volume here from, for Vartem. The, the reason I'm doing this here is because I want to use uh, uh, the local SSDs uh, on, on Google Container. So I have local SSDs mounted on my Kubernetes nodes, and then I mount that up into the, the Docker builder process to make it faster and to, to make it reuse that outside of the file system, because otherwise it will just like make a temporary thing and do the same thing over and over. So this saves a lot of cycles, because it doesn't have to rebuild the, state, the steps that didn't change. So you specify some sort of registry, and then uh, what re the repo you want to publish to. So for this thing, you want it to be my company, my app, I guess. So if you have, that's where it will, on the, on the Docker, Docker registry, it will push things. Also, we need some sort of secrets to be able to authenticate here. Uh, so we typically have something like a Docker username and password, which is pro provided to the registry so that it can do the publishing. Uh, and uh, one thing that I do here is I, I, I automatically set a, a tag for the branch that the, the commit was done on, but uh, doc, Docker brand tag names don't really like slashes. And uh, one of the things we've been using is like the convention of feature slash name of the feature, which is very bad for the registry. So here I just do a simple search and replace for, for slashes with underscore, which, which fits better. And then I use the first eight uh, characters of the commit SHA for, for a tag that I, I tend to use for deployment. So you can see here, you can specify for each of these steps when they run. So here we run one every time something is pushed to build that. We also run when we tag a new release. Uh, and we can also and we can also run it for the de deployment step if someone wants to do a new deployment. So at this point, maybe we, we will say that, okay, we managed to actually build this thing, so it's time to announce this somewhere, for instance, in a Slack channel. And our, there's also a Telegram plugin if you use Telegram, or uh, you could have IRC bots running and, and, uh, and notify you people. So here you can see I'm using the when thing again to make sure that uh, when the thing succeeds, we want to say, hey, this went really well, and we used the thumbs up emoji on Slack. So that's what, what we use. And you need like some sort of secret here to handle the authentication. Uh, and then, if it doesn't go so well, we use the thumbs down here and uh, we notify on our notification channel that uh, with a drone, the drone user is going to tell you that your build failed and you have to go check out why you pushed something that was broken. And then it will stop, obviously. Uh, so this, this is an example of something that will run even if the previous steps has failed. So if, if, if the build step failed, it would not run the Docker step. But then since we define that this thing is running when status is failure, then it would uh, run anyways, even if the previous step failed. Uh, yeah. So next thing we want to do is to actually deploy this thing. And there is a, a plugin for that so from Honesty Drone Kubernetes. It's, this is, so this, here you specify which image the plugin is on. And then it gets all of these things from our secrets. It gets uh, Kubernetes server, username, the password, your certif client certificates. Uh, and then we specify that we want on the deployment my app for your container. I think it was actually called my app as well. So that should probably set my app there. Uh, then we, uh, and, and the repo is, is this one. Then we set the image to this repo. And uh, we, I used the drone commit SHA that we generated in, and that we tagged the, the thing with when we pushed to the, the, the registry earlier. So this will trigger a, a new rolling deployment every time you commit to, for instance, if you say that your master branch should always be published, then you can work on feature branches and those could be published to test servers and we can make, make a new test server or have a, a shared one, depending on how you do the resources. And so test builds could go to a different deployment and this could, one could go to your production deployment. 
Uh, so I have a side note here about the secrets. So the secrets are currently managed by a, a CLI command. The drone command lets you also like inspect builds and, and uh, see what, what registers you have. And at the moment, you have to do a secret add here. And then uh, you're logged in. You first you log in with the drone app, and that talks to the, to the drone server and tells it the secrets per repos. Uh, so you can uh, not get the secrets back out through this interface, but you can set them and update them if you change your password or whatever. That's like a security precaution. And you should be careful to, to not expose your secrets to plugins you don't trust. Make sure that you know what you're doing. Uh, or don't like smoke uh, public repositories that you don't. For instance, if you smoke pull requests, uh, and uh, you allow them to put whatever code in the drone YML, you could have a security problem because they could just put like echo my super secret Kubernetes password in there and, and uh, they don't that. So don't. So you can set up which steps you want to run on actual pull, pull requests and make sure uh, you have some, some security focus there. Uh, so this is how we do it at the moment, but uh, there's a uh, 0.9 ver version of drone is currently in, in alpha. You can download it and test it now. And it supports getting the, using the Kubernetes uh, secrets directly, which is much better, because then you can uh, reuse the same secrets that you use in your, in your uh, actually deployed environment uh, in your PCI pipeline as well. And those are encrypted at rest, and uh, they are a pretty safe way of doing things. So you can set them up. Uh, in the GUI. Typically, what I do with most of my resources is I keep them in, in a, 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 a folder and then use a template system. We use GoPass to store our secrets for our own internal use. And you, I also have a, a, a plug. Um, there's also something called um, uh, Contemplate, which allows you to template these resources, keep them in a version control, and then when you do uh, uh, apply, it will automatically get the secrets and insert them into your template from your deep. And then if you have, and ask you for your GPG key or whatever before they insert it, so it's a very safe and safe, same way of doing it. Uh, yeah. So this is uh, basically uh, uh, the setup for doing like the end-to-end -end Docker thingy, but like. Uh, it kind of you also sometimes you also have like your own internal modules that you depend on for your application, but you don't really want to make a Docker container for each of them. Maybe it's just like uh, a, a library that you use or something. And uh, a good thing to do there is to make your own dark pan using uh, OPAN. And I've actually set up uh, uh, OPAN uh, in Kubernetes so that it can maintain like a layer of your own modules, and then it will just if you have your module, it will install from there. Otherwise, it will fetch it from, from the actual CPAN and install that one. And this also allows you to do pinning. So I think uh, Christopher mentioned OPAN yesterday. Uh, so it's also a malicious application, actually. It's written by Matt Strout, and I have had a pen pull request pending for him at, uh, for like the last four or five months. And this week, I finally managed to get him to merge it. So in the latest release that happened this week, uh, you can now actually do uh, use CPAN uploader to upload to your own, uh, uh, open service. So you can have a centralized open running, for instance, in your Kubernetes cluster, like I'm showing here, just with a, sim a snippet from, from a deployment file. And then you can, in your drone pipeline, uh, you could upload directly to that one. So you could have something like uh, this here as a, as a step in your build pipeline. If this model, if this is something you don't want to have a Docker container, instead of building the Docker container and deploying to Kubernetes, your last step could be just uploading it to OPAN. Uh, and uh, so here you have like a the, the, the way it works is it doesn't really care about your username, but it checks the password for a set of tokens that you provide. You, you can see we provided the tokens here from a Kubernetes secret when we set, when we started running the OPAN mirror. Uh, and then uh, it will just get the real path. And the tarball that you created in your previous step, you made you did made this, make this, or you used up, uh, or you used uh, Batman's uh, Git ship maybe to make a make a tarball here. And then you just upload that. Uh, and then in your actual app, then you could use. Uh, 
uh, in the Docker file, you could then you would have to actually put the password there because you can't do, or you would have to do a search replace in your pipeline. That's something I've done sometimes. If you need to get something in a Docker file and you want to have a sensitive, you can just do a, use sed to get the secret in the in the in the drone step, and then when you do the Docker build, you could insert the password here. So uh, it will not. Hmm? Or you could use build arg. That's a good point as well. Uh, yeah, so here you have, I have a, uh, open running on my company, and you could use the same Nginx ingress insert to protect your open mirror with basic auth as well. Or, uh, yeah, so this is only saying uh, mirror only, and it installs this thing, and it deletes the CPAN folder, so you only get all red of that actual model, the same way we looked at earlier. Uh, Yeah, so I guess that was my last slide, and uh, I hope I can have continuous integration now, and that uh, you maybe have some questions. Uh, why uh, do you use uh, Ubuntu as a base image and not uh, Perl uh, base images? Officially provided by Docker, because the Ubuntu image, well, our previous deployment platform was using Ubuntu, but also because the Ubuntu images are providing a minimal version now, which are a lot smaller than the base Perl images. Uh, the base, I think, the base size of the Perl image is not small at all. Uh, they, have, they have a slim version now, which is around seventy. Megabytes. So now there is a slim uh, version of the image for Perl. Really? That it's, yeah, uh, based on uh, Debian. So it's around 70 megabytes. So what we're doing is of using the full as a build step, uh, yeah. simple stage build, and just copying over the modules that have been installed into the slim one. Mm. So I, I, what I actually do in my own company is I have a, a base image that I install all of the things in first, like the, uh, I have a periodic installer that installs all of the CPAN and, and dependencies because I want to speed up, I don't want to actually do the CPAN install at this step. I want to have it done in a, pre, in, a, in a base image and then all the applications use that common base image. But I definitely think you could use the Ubuntu Slim thing. We've been also been looking at Alpine, but it's kind of, so that to make, with Alpine you could make your image even smaller, but then you have to deal with the differences between uh, what Alpine is and, and uh, and one of the reasons is like all of our developers almost that use Linux use Ubuntu, so uh, it makes it somewhat easier for us. But if there's a slim problem, like you said, that, that sounds definitely sounds like a good good idea. Other questions? I have one question. Yes. Um, I, I noticed that in all your examples where you ran cpanm in order to install something, you skip the tests at every one of them. Could you explain me why that's a good idea? Should you at least you know, try to run the tests in your dependencies once at least there? Oh, I expect the dependencies to uh, have been smoked by, by cpanm mirror, so. All right. <laughs> And uh, I want to build. I want to build to be fast. So, but yeah, I commend your trust in the community. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else with a question or comment? Joel. <laughs> well so I know almost nothing about uh, Kubernetes and things. I have some. DevOps guys at work who do all this for me, but um, if I were coming at this fresh, I would say I would be very lost when I think about sort of that graph you showed of all the different things. Is there some visualization once you've got these things working? Can you see the setup and the, the, the what, what would happen if you were to run some of these commands, or, or do you have to just know from all your configuration? Uh, is there some web admin UI that gives you some Yeah, view? so if you use Google, they provide their own web admin where you can go and look at all the different workloads. But there is also a built-in web admin tool in Kubernetes. And uh, you can also, I kind of like using the CLI tools, and they can give you a lot of detailed information about the state. You can use describe to describe anything, and you can tail logs using the kubectl thing to see 
what why something went wrong. Uh, if you if you really need to, you can even like enter one of your Docker containers and then uh, poke around and debug. But typically, if you have done that, I would recommend that you kill it afterwards and let it be recreated so that so that uh, you don't have local state. Uh, but, um, yeah, if you want to follow like uh, there is a web GUI, but I would I usually like to use it in the CLI, but that's a, that's a preference, I guess. Okay. I so think that's, uh, that's the that's last question. If so I guess we should move on to the other thing that yeah, I so have to Yeah, so this talk. concludes the talk. So that concludes my talk. Thank you.